Look, the president has been talking about this for a long time. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Other countries have created unfair trade policies for decades that have harmed our national and economic security. The president wants a strong economy and a strong national security. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders yesterday defending the president's proposed tariffs on imported aluminum and steel. And we could learn more details about the president's plans today because he will be holding a White House ceremony. Joining me now is Louisiana Senator John Kennedy. Senator, thanks for being here this morning. It's always good to have you on the program. Thanks, Senator. You took initially a wait-and-see approach to the president's proposals on these tariffs. Where do you stand today? I'm still waiting and seeing a couple of points. Number one, I don't think, think any person should be surprised. The president, uh, even before he was president, talked about uh, the trade imbalances that we have with many countries. Whether you agree with him or not, uh, he, this isn't something he just dreamed up. Number two, before I've suggested to my colleagues that before we all get lubed up, let's wait and see what the president actually does. And we don't have that fact yet. Number three, uh, I think the president understands, I hope he does, that the real problem, at least in terms of steel, for example, is China. Uh, China, in terms of steel and generally in terms of trade, China is eating our lunch and the sack it came in. Now, I don't mean any disrespect, but China cheats. Uh, this problem with, with steel prices started two years ago, really before that, but it, it started in earnest two years ago. The economy in China slowed. China produces half the world's steel. Rather than doing what a capitalist society would do and say, okay, we're going to dial it back and, and we're going to have to downsize, China kept on going and they just started exporting their product. Mm. And, and the, the price fell through the floor. Half of the overcapacity in steel is a result of China, and we need to call China's hand. And, the, and China is, is the focus of the president, and we're getting word now from the White House that they seem to be, and the president seems to be open to exemptions from products coming from Canada and Mexico and some other U.S. allies. So when you say we don't know the details, we really don't know the details till they're formally announced. But this will all happen fast, right, Senator, because yes. these tariffs have to be implemented within 15 days of them formally being announced by the president that time period could give others time to step in and request exemptions are you are you in support of this sort of plan from the president if that is what it is I, I think the president would be prudent to get tough with China I'm gonna say it again no disrespect but China cheats and what you allow is what will continue I hope uh, that, that he won't punish our allies. Um, he's right about there being a steel glut, and, 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 the, and the, that fact hurts our people. But um, I don't, I don't want to punish the innocent along with the guilty. Are you concerned about the unintended consequence, consequences here at home, though, Senator? Sure. I mean, even Republicans are speaking out about the rising cost to the consumer and the rising cost to manufacturers in this country that use these commodities. Well, yes. Um, I mean, trade is complicated. You have to consider not only the, uh, the impact on, uh, as a result of the tariffs on your country, but you have to consider the impact of the tariffs on other countries and how, if, if at all, they're going to reciprocate. Uh, and, and a tariff is really a tax. It will raise the price of steel uh, for many people who use steel. Now, I'm not saying that's altogether bad if those tariffs are targeted to try to change misbehavior. Mm -hmm. And and again, I, I think the, the genesis of this problem is China. And, and that's where I hope the uh, president targets his firepower. And perhaps these exemptions will allow him to focus on just that. So if you could design the announcement that we are about to see hours from now from this president, what, mm -hmm. what would you be the biggest fan of this president announcing this afternoon? I would like to see the president uh, as a first step saying, look, I believe in free trade. We all do. Um, and I think America pretty much plays by the rules. But some countries don't. And our friends in China are not playing by the rules on steel. We've had enough. We're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. And they're going to stop and we're going to put up a tariff. They're responsible for 50% of the overcapacity and we're going to start with China. 
It's been a, it's a fascinating to watch politically because you've got Democrats in some area of this country who have to stick up for those manufacturers who who feel that these tariffs will raise prices and it, it, it is going to be something to watch, Senator. Meanwhile, I want to ask you mm -hmm. uh, about this net neutrality bill that you are introducing uh, yes. to prohibit internet providers from blocking or slowing content. What is its aim? Well, everybody in the Senate that I talk to on both sides of the aisle says the same thing. We need to do a bill. We need to move a bill. There's just one problem. Nobody wants to step forward. So I basically took Representative Blackburn's bill from the House, made a few small changes, and I put it out there in the Senate. It stops throttling. It would prohibit blocking. It leaves paid prioritization open because that's mm -hmm. something we need to negotiate. It would preempt the state so mm -hmm. we would have one national standard. Um, you know, the, the wing nuts, the extremes on both sides won't like it, but I think, I yeah. think uh, a lot of people will. It doesn't mean I've made up my mind on the CRA because I haven't. All right. Um, but we've got to start somewhere, and everybody's just talking instead of doing. Okay. Well, you are introducing that net neutrality bill. Senator, thank you so much for being here this morning. It's always good to see you. You bet. Thank you, Sam. In a moment here, the AG Jeff Sessions calling out California. How dare you needless. Now, and sir, good day to you and good morning. I know you've been out campaigning and appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. I, I, I want to show you from 2016 what the president did in that same district. Hillary Clinton, 39, a difference of 19 points. That is just, uh, that's deep red. Why is this race said to be neck and neck, sir? Well, it's a special election and open seat. So, you know, I'm, I'm a political scientist, and I know you covered this for, for many years. Uh, so there's a lot of attention. It's the only race going on in the nation, so it's attracted a lot of outside attention, outside money, outside interest. So you could expect, uh, especially in a special election where turnout is very important, uh, you could expect the things to tighten up. Um, there's a story out just in the past 24 hours about some friction or tension between you and some others in your party. Can you clear that up? Is that happening? Yeah, that's the nonsense the left keeps putting out. I don't put any credence in it at all. I've got support all the way from the president, all the way down to the, through the state party, down to the local districts, always have. It's all hands on deck. We have uh, President Trump coming out again on Saturday. We're real excited about that. We have Kellyanne coming out here this afternoon. We've had Vice President Pence here. We have uh, support from the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader and the, the whip and the Deputy Whip. I mean, everybody's on board, the Pennsylvania delegation. The left tries to put out these uh, crazy stories, and uh, I think very few people outside the, the Beltway uh, read that. Well, I, I was reading it not from, from the perspective of those on the left, but rather some Republican colleagues who apparently had some, some suggestions about how you run your campaign. Now, President Trump, as you mentioned, will be there on Saturday. It's getting a lot of attention. Joe Biden was there the other day. What is this tariff issue doing to those uh, who vote in southwestern Pennsylvania? Steel country. Well, this is steel country, Bill. I'm, I'm sitting in uh, Steel City right now. And, uh, you know, I've always supported the steel industry. And our steel workers here uh, can compete with anybody in the world uh, without any problem as long as the playing field is level. But the playing field has been slanted. I think President Trump is just trying to uh, level that back out again. And he's getting wide support from the people in my district. Well, the majority of those in your district are registered Democrats, but they have voted Republican. And I'm just trying to get an idea about what, what, what's moving in southwestern PA over the past 14 months um, that, would, that would have this race apparently close. Now, Charlie Cook says it's leaning your way. There it is, bottom left-hand corner, Congressional District 18. Why is it that way, sir? So remember, I, it's, I, I was elected in my state house seat the first time in a 76% Democrat district, heavily union district, uh, heavily Democrat, and, uh, and now I win by 70% of the vote. So uh, this has always been a Democrat area, but uh, they vote for the person, and I have a strong message that resonates with the people here, and I've served them well now in the state legislature for the last eight years. So I think you'll see that uh, we'll come out just fine. Uh, Connor Lamb's your opponent. He's 33 years old, former Marine. Well, he's still a Marine. Once a Marine, always Marine. Um, prediction on Tuesday? What's the margin? Oh, I don't know. I, I've never been one to predict, uh, you know, percentages or margins. But I think we'll do. We'll do well. Uh, we're in the lead. We'll stay in the lead. I think we'll pick up some more. 
Uh, you know, as I said, we have that strong message. I'm a veteran also, 18 and a half years in the United States Air Force fighting counterterrorism, counterespionage. So I've done a lot. I've done a lot in the legislature. I'm a PhD in international relations. I've been to North Korea. I've got a resume that my opponent doesn't have. And, and Connor the Chameleon is just, uh, you know, he's one thing one day, one thing the other day, uh, another day. So I think people will see that and uh, they will come out and vote for me. Five days to go, sir. Thank you for your time. Rick Saccone there. Thank you. In Pittsburgh. Appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thanks. A White House meeting on tariffs set to begin just hours from now. Are, are they moving ahead as planned or listening to calls for moderation? Our political panel weighs in ahead. Do we want to make sure that abusers are held to account, especially China, with, with, when it comes to dumping and transshipping? But we also want to make sure that every step we take forward uh, does not create any unintended consequences. To the lens of the worker. He wants us to have strong steel and aluminum industries in this country. He believes this country has been on the losing side of trade deals for decades. So he wants fair, reciprocal trade deals that stop screwing the American worker and American industries. Well, Kelly and Conway earlier today talking about the trade policies, the changes here in America's newsroom as we await an event this afternoon at the White House on the hottest topic of the week, and that's tariffs. 3.30 Eastern Time, live coverage here on the channel. Chris Steyerwald, Fox News Politics Editor. Charlie Hurd, opinion editor, Washington Times, and a Fox News contributor. And to the viewers at home, you should see these two gentlemen walking in the door. I mean, they are just, they're just talking, talking. They are ladies who lunch, and off we go. Um, gentlemen, good day to you. Uh, I'm going to make a larger point in a moment here about the policies the president is pursuing based on some of these Senate races we're seeing. But is, is there a risk on this tariff deal today, Charlie? Uh, you mean for the president? Yes. No, I don't think that there is because he is fulfilling campaign promises. And, and you, know, I, you know, I'm all in favor of free trade. I love free trade. But, but there's a real problem that Republicans have, have failed. That, you know, they win the fight uh, on free trade, getting free trade, but then they fail to... To, to continue the argument and, and win the, the argument with voters that this is actually good for them. Well, and, the, and, and, and especially when you see so much evidence where it suggests that it's actually bad for them. I wonder if voters in southwestern PA talking to Rick Saccone there, I mean, how, how drilled are they into this issue? I would imagine they're they're pretty much up to speed. Well, they are. Um, and this actually, that's a, a, the perfect race to mention. And I don't know how much the president had that particular race in mind, which has turned into a litmus test basically the Republicans have poured seven eight million dollars into one single house and it's a house district that won't exist in November uh, and but it is turned into this litmus test and I don't know how much that individual race was on the president's mind when he's talking about raising the prices on uh, foreign steel but this issue works almost as well, if not better, for Democrats than it does for Republicans, because it gave Conor Lamb the lifeline he needed in that race to be able to say, I'm actually with the president on this one. I agree with the president on this one. And that's why you heard Joe Interesting. Manchin, and Interesting. that's why you heard all these red state Democrats. Say. You were on the air last night with Martha, True. and Carl Rove is your sparring partner down in Texas, and you were talking about the results of the Texas primary, and Rove has thrown cold water on this oh, yeah. in a big way. This is just part of what he said last night. After all the hubbub coming in, this was the Democrats are having a fantastic night. They had a dreadful night. Their leader, uh, Robert F. Beto O'Rourke, spent $4.2 million, won the Democratic primary with 62% of the vote. That's half as many votes as Ted Cruz got on the Republican side. No. Uh, he went on and on. <laughs> that, that, that was just a little appetizer from Rove last evening. Bigger point here, not just Texas, but Axio has a story out today that, that talks about Trump's approval rating in states that are up for, up for grabs in November. His approval rating is higher than the incumbent running in that state. That's West Virginia, North Dakota, Montana, Indiana, Missouri, and Ohio. And you look at this tariff story later today, and you go back to the campaign days, and you think about what he said on the campaign, on taxes, on trade, on Jerusalem, on China, on the wall, on North Korea, on immigration. And he's going to make the case, you guys voted for me. I told you I was going to do this, and now I am... I am in the process of making a lot of this happen. Not everything, but a lot of it. Just take the 
arguing on that, Charlie? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously in Washington and it, with Democrats, everybody's talking about this forming blue wave, and it, 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 especially in the House, it, 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 you know, the Republicans have an uphill fight in, in the House. But when you start looking at some of these races, there's the very little concrete evidence of that this blue wave is forming. Uh, I do think that Texas was a disappointment. Uh, but the, the, the caution here for Republicans, though, is that when you look at a majority of those uh, Democrats who would lose today would lose to unnamed Republicans. Unnamed Republicans. And then when the Republican gets named, then the Democrat's going to win. Right. And so, so Republicans have to be careful about who they pick, but also they have to be careful about f making the argument that, that you're, you're talking about here that Trump made that won that state. Yeah. And I'm doing what I said. They have to, is what they, I'm even if you, even if you don't love Trump, you've got to run on the Trump platform. And, and, and so will some Democrats, yeah. and so will Joe Manchin, uh, and so will Sherrod Brown in Ohio, uh, and so will Bob Casey Jr. in Pennsylvania. On this issue in particular, Democrats are going to embrace the president with both arms, while Republicans, because remember, Republicans represent largely export states, and they represent a lot of farm states. But in these states where the steel industry still has purchase, where it still has power in those states, you're going to see Democrats get real jiggy with Donald Trump real quick. Uh, and you guys continue, continue talking. We'll go to lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Don't make it liquid. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Sandra back in New Leave York. Leave it to Chris to always have a way with words. Look at this. A five-year-old girl dangling from a ski lift. This incident caught on camera. It happened at Bear Mountain, California. Someone on the lift holding onto the girl's jacket. Her parents said she was taking ski lessons. Several people rushed over to catch her, and they used a tarp. <laughs> Celebration on the ground there. Thankfully, no serious injuries. Bear Mountain Resort now investigating this incident and what exactly happened. Scary stuff, but she is safe. Well, the battle lines are drawn on sanctuary cities in the Golden State. Attorney General Jeff Sessions making it clear that there is a new sheriff in town and that the Trump administration will not accept, quote, radical California lawmakers pushing their open borders agenda. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson is here with his reaction next. Somebody needs to stand up and say, no, you've gone too far. You cannot do Some of their harshest critics in an effort to explore a possible link between violent games and guns. Now, this meeting in response to the Parkland school massacre more than three weeks ago. Let's bring in Francesca Chambers, White House correspondent for the Daily Mail. Uh, Francesca, this isn't the first time Washington has tried to explore the link between violent video games and real life shooting. But decades of research so far has failed to find a link between the two. So what is the goal of today's meeting with video game industry reps? And that's absolutely correct. And that's what the video game industry is saying heading into this meeting. They're saying that in other parts of the world, gun violence isn't nearly as high as the United States, even though the entertainment is still distributed there. President Trump, however, said last week that he believes that there could be a link between the two. And he even made it personal, bringing up his son, Barron, who's 11 years old, saying that he's surprised by the some of the things that he's watching. So in today's meeting, he will have lawmakers who have been surprised supportive of this idea that there could be a link, as well as Brent Bozell, who works at the Media Research Center, which has also pushed this as a possibility. This comes down to, to parenting. I mean, because in, in the past, you know, in 2005, for example, Hillary Clinton introduced a bill. She tried to, to tighten restrictions on selling games to minors. You name me one minor that has the money to buy one of these video games. They're expensive. So it's the parents that are buying the games. And who's going to prevent the parents from buying a video game? Nobody, unless the video content itself changes altogether. And there is currently a rating system that the video game industry imposes, but President Trump said last week that he'd also like to see that change potentially, opening up the idea for some sort of congressional action, which is why I think lawmakers will be in the room today. Okay, so certainly they're not going to ban all games involving guns altogether. Right. So is this sort of a dead end?